Hi, I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, and welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. Today, I am so excited that we have Shana Beeksma joining us on the podcast. She is an award-winning lawyer and the founder of Beeksma Law. She went to law school at my alma mater too, which is Osgoode Hall Law School in 2011, and she was called to the bar in Ontario in 2012. She completed her articles at the Toronto office of Gowling LaFleur Henderson, now known as Gowling WLG. And following her articling, she continued to develop her skills and knowledge at a boutique, commercial, and estate litigation firm in Burlington, and subsequently moved to a prominent mid-sized Hamilton firm before opening Beaks Mala in 2018. Shana, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. I'm so excited to talk all about your journey and how you came to this place. So I know that I've just given a bit of background, but if you could just expand on that a little bit and talk about the sort of broad strokes of your journey, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty. Sure. Sounds great. Happy to share. So I actually came here from Jamaica at the age of 15. So I, I didn't grow up in Canada. I grew up overseas and then went through the usual route. You know, I'm finishing high school here at undergrad. I did it at Laurier in terms of specializing in psychology and global studies. So I did not do poli-sci, first of all. For the listeners who are thinking we must do poli-sci or criminology or something like that to get into law school. Nope. I'm one of many who did not do that. Including myself. Yeah, we did. Yeah. I did not. <laughs> there you go. I mean, yep. by the time I got to law school, there are people that did archaeology, anthropology, oh, yeah. fine arts, you know, engineering, so- biology, everything, everything. There's a spattering across fields. So I'm actually really happy you brought that up. Yeah. Yep. And I want people to know that, right? Because it's such a, you know, a fallacy, really, that everybody needs to have some degree in those fields of like poli sci criminology to even get into law school or succeed. So, yes, yeah, so I studied what I wanted to in a nutshell in undergrad. And I highly recommend people doing that because you're more likely to do well. Law schools want good marks. So do something you enjoy. And frankly, it's the last time you're going to be doing something that you really enjoy unless you're one of the few who truly loves and breathes the law. And let's be honest, chatting amongst, you know, my fellow colleagues in the profession, most of us like the law, but most of us don't absolutely love it. So yeah, study what you want to in undergrad and then you make sure that you do well at it because then you have the doors open to you. So I enjoyed my undergrad and then I took a year between actually. So I did a bit of an atypical path. I took a year off and I spent it at Humber College doing a legal assistant program because, number one, I had decided on law school too late. I just missed the application deadline of November in my fourth year. And I decided on law like in February of my fourth year. So I had to take a year. So I figured, let me make use of that year. I mean, there are some people that just, you know, when I traveled abroad, but I figured, let me at least figure out, do I even want to really do law? I went into law because it was suggested, strongly recommended by one of my professors in fourth year, because I thought I was going to do a master's in international development, you know, and kind of just flow from there, kind of a loosey-goosey plan, but nothing really concrete. And he held three of my marks in fourth year in his hands in terms of being my prof for three courses. And so I was like, I better listen to what this man has to say and at least humor him. And he sat me down during office hours and said, like, what are you doing after you complete your degree? You're coming up on the end of your fourth year. And I told him that, you know, maybe a master's or so. And he looks at me, chuckles in that, you know, old professorial way and says, have you ever considered law? And I tried to stifle a laugh because I'm thinking, what? Why? No. People told me I argued too much as a kid. Maybe I should be a lawyer, but I never took that seriously. I was never that woman that thought, you know, throughout her childhood, all I want to be is a lawyer. I know people like that, but I was not one of those. And he said, look into it and then come back to me in two weeks. So I figured out, let me humor him. I can't risk, you know, getting a bad mark in his classes. And the rest is history because much to my surprise, the field of law was broader than what those of us who were born in the 80s and grew up in the 90s were familiar with in terms of law and order and whatnot, being about like criminal law and family law. And, you know, I was interested to find, it was the first time I found out that there was human international human rights law. 
international criminal law. Now I'm doing primarily estate law, business law, and real estate law, but I never really thought much about law being that broad. My view of law was very narrow until then. So long story short, here I am. I mean, I went on to apply to law school because I realized that maybe I'll be well-suited. Maybe he's on to something. No surprise, he went on to write, you know, one of my glowing reference letters. And yeah, I got into Osgood among a few other places and chose it. So I could stay at home because my mom lived in Toronto and plus it's Osgood, <laughs> right? But you're like, right. might as well. So that was how I got into law school. So like many of us, if I were to look back at my personal statement now, compared to what I'm doing, they are leaps and bounds apart because my personal statement was all about, you know, that rock star of, of the legal fields of international human rights law that everybody and their mother wanted to do. And you're chatting with your fellow one else, you know, your first year law student peeps in your first year and everybody seems every other person wanted to do exactly that international human rights law. But most of us are not doing that at this point. And there are various reasons for that. But one of the big ones being that at that time, at least 2010, 2011, there was only one position in all of Canada, for instance, in international human, human rights law, specifically with Amnesty International, right? One. So you start to see that your opportunities to be trained in this field and be paid to be trained, not having to volunteer, are very few and far in between. And law school is expensive, y'all. We all got bills to pay. So not everybody could afford to effectively give away their time for free to be trained in this field. And then I remember when I was looking into it more, to get into that field, I knew someone at Gowlings, actually. She was an associate, I think probably in her third or fourth year at the time, who really wanted to do international human rights law and went into that. Actually, she left Bay Street around in year five to do that. But she left after saving up a bit of a nest egg to yes. do that because she knew that if you want to do that, you're going to have to intern in The Hague and it's unpaid for a few years, right? Until you can get a paid position. So that's when I found that, look, this doesn't jive with my student loan demands. And realistically, you know, it's finding that it's a really hard field to get into. And do I really want it that badly? Is there anything wrong with considering other fields? And so, you know, as luck would have it, I went through the OCI process at law school and got multiple offers in the midst of the 08, 09 recession. So I'm like, I would be stupid to walk away from a summering physician with a large Bay Street firm, basically guaranteed art cling. The joke was that you could only not come back for art if you, you know, burnt the building down. So, <laughs> so really it's like, you know, just go for it and see what doors are opened. So I ended up doing commercial litigation. And you liked it. Yeah. And I liked it, you know, but I, you know, I liked it and I didn't. I was very disillusioned when articling was done. And that was largely because I was so burnt out. Oh, yeah. So, and also on top of that, I was one of the 47% of my articling class who were not hired back. And at Gowlings, it was all women that were not hired back. The six guys out of the 17 were all hired back. And I found out that, you know, from somebody who had, you know, sat at those meetings, at those hired back meetings and spoke to me, you know, kind of anonymously that way, like confidentially, that, look, Shana, there were times where you were in and there were times where you were just out of the vote. So you know that, you know, it wasn't meant to be. And so then I had to figure out, do I even want to do law? Because my thing was that with those kinds of demands on my life, I was fine with, you know, working hard for a few years or whatnot, or even 10 years if need be, if I knew that it would get better later on. But the problem with Bay Street was that I could see that it didn't get better. The partners mm. were still there on weekends. The partners were still there late at night. And we're still, because on average, I was working 16 to 18 hour days during that articling year, which is very normal. Turning out good work and all of that, because I had great, great references, you know, too many to count, which is wonderful. It helped me land well after. But my mom had had breast cancer during that year. She's still, she's still alive. She's still with us, thankfully. But that's when I realized that a rigorous, demanding Bay Street practice leaves little room for your personal life to go wrong because kids don't have the bandwidth. So hence why I was burnt out after that first year. So I knew that if the practice of law involved Bay Street demands, and I didn't think it was for me. And I would probably hack it if I needed to until I paid off my student loans and then did what I wanted to do. But thankfully, that's not the only way to practice law. Okay. So the first thing that I want to pick up on is burnout. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that, so I want to pick up on two things. The first is burnout. And the second is this idea that really, honestly, like 99% of law students have that like Bay Street is the way to go or whatever big city you're in, whatever that, you know, financial district, whatever it is, street is that is yours, that that's the only way to go. And I just remember even when when I was in law school, and I, so I don't think anything has changed <laughs> in the time between when you and I both graduated, that this is perceived, Bay Street or its equivalent is perceived as the way to go. I was also at a law firm downtown. And although I, I would actually say that I very rarely worked on weekends, the firm actually had some really good, I had a really good experience with, with time management there for the most part. But I think that the grind is something that we as law students and also high achievers think we have to do, like that we have to sort of suffer through the grind. And the burnout from that is so real that so many articling students and young associates experience it, but don't talk about it because of feelings of shame. Yep, absolutely. And so was that your experience too, that it was happening all around, but only when you brought it up, did somebody else say, yeah, me too. Absolutely. And yep. people are because shameful it, about it. And you're seen, you're seen as weak, right? Everybody knew that. And especially prior to hire back, nobody wants to drop any hint of weakness or inability to hack it, right? So you're trying to paint to your strongest persona and being very wary of who you would trust with that kind of information. I know that I had one trusted good friend who I was articling with as well. She and I were, you know, often the only ones there at 2 a.m., right? And so the conversations you have with colleagues, right? When you're there and you're grinding out legal research memos and drafting fact for the for the partners, and it's 2 a.m. and you manage to get pizza in before the doors to the building locked at midnight, you know, just you can have some very frank conversations. I remember we were having a we were both there late and I was she was proofreading something. I think the doc pleading that I had drafted and I guess I was resting on a pile of papers. So I just put my head down and I remember her saying things you never forget from 12 years ago. She says, Please don't drool on my pleadings. I have to file those in the morning. <laughs> yeah, that final copy that's printed, they're like gold. You don't want to attach them. Like, <laughs> But although now everything's filed online, so for those who are getting exactly. into practice law now, like that must seem like the Stone Ages. But it's like, you don't want crinkly paper for what's going to be filed in the morning. But yeah, I was able to have those kinds of transparent conversations with her. We both did and thought, you know, this is ridiculous. Like while we're young, while we're 25, fine, but do I want to be doing this at this rate in my 40s? No, mm -hmm. absolutely not. Right. And it's funny because speaking of burnout, I remember that same friend of mine, we're still good friends to this day. She's now also no longer on Bay Street. She's actually in-house with the Army JAG, actually, of all things. So very different in terms of thinking about ways you can still be a lawyer and lawyer, if that is what you know any of your listeners are looking at, you can be an Army lawyer as well. So, and then you're moving around just like, you know, folks who are in the reserves and whatnot, you're moving around the country, but, and you can be deployed overseas, but you're doing legal work. Yeah. But yet you still have to know how to shoot again. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting one. For sure. But I mentioned that because she had said to me during one of our late night conversations, she says, Shana, what do you, what do you want on your tombstone? I'm thinking, what? I am not in the mind mindset right now to have a deep conversation like this. Like, are you kidding me? I have a memo to get out in the morning. Yeah. And then she says, no, seriously, stop a second and think, what do you want on your tombstone? So at the time I was freshly married. So I said, I don't know, loving wife, maybe mother, if I ended up becoming a mother, sister, daughter, friend. And so she leans back in her chair and she chuckles at me. She's like, so lawyer isn't on there, is it? And I said, no, I wouldn't want my uh, you know lawyer to be on my tombstone unless it was so interesting influential in helping someone. And it was such a big part of my life story that it would be remiss not to mention it and then mention it for that purpose. So then she said, it's funny how you remember these conversations, you know, a decade on. She says, well, then let that guide you as you figure out your next steps. And I've never forgotten that, you know, that what are your priorities in life? And then as much as you can, and we have more control than we think we do, 
make decisions about our professional path and our personal path that are getting us closer to that destination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's such powerful advice. And which brings me full circle to my next point, which is that through that burnout. So I think that the one, probably the one good thing that can come from burnout is self-reflection and reevaluation. Absolutely. And that's what I see with clients, with myself, when I've had these experiences through burnout, with anybody that I talk with who's who's been burned out, is that it's forced self-reflection. Yes. What do I actually want? And I actually do this work with my clients beforehand, right? Either during application processes or when they start working with me during their professional lives or even during their school programs when we work together throughout. And so this evaluation, reevaluation of what it is that you want, some we it's commonly known as visualization, manifesting, that sort of work. When you experience burnout, you're forced into that. You are forced, maybe not at the very beginning, but as you're coming out of the burnout and you're able to sort of see the forest for the trees and you're able to sort of look around and say, okay, what is it that I really want now? That's a really actually important thing that can come from burnout. And for you, you had these really important conversations, maybe beforehand, maybe as it was happening and certainly after. And your trajectory shifted a little bit. Absolutely. And I know you now, and I know that you've created this firm and this life that allows you to be everything that you want to be. Of course, we all still have, you know, things that we're working out along the way, but the structure that we, that we are building is determined not by other people, but by ourselves and our autonomy and our agency for what it is that we want our choices to be for ourselves and our families. So, can you talk to me a bit about that shift for you and what that looked like? So this, yes, absolutely. So the shift for me looked like exactly like you described in at the outset in terms of coming out of the ashes of burnout and reflecting. And it started off with continuing to do what people told me I should be doing, which was, well, after not being hired back, apply for jobs at other Bay Street firms. Yes, most people have done their hire back, but some still have some vacancies. And so partners that I worked for, you know, were making phone calls to friends who knew that, okay, a position has popped up in, say, the financial services group at XY firm, you know, you should put through an application. And, you know, when you're starting to see the red flags in your own mind, but you're kind of ignoring it and trying to do what people think you should be doing, I was doing exactly that in terms of applying for these positions, but secretly hoping I wouldn't get called back for an interview. And so looking back, that was such a red flag in terms of you are not in the environment in which you are going to thrive. And you're doing things right now for appearances to please others because they see all this potential in you. They know you can succeed down here. Yes, you just narrowly missed the higher back vote, but come on, one of the other sister firms would be glad to have you. And it's like, no. No, I need to turn that off. And so not necessarily sabotaging myself when I was, you know, following up on those leads, but also not really pursuing them either. Like being very, it's been a bluntly half-assed. You know, I had a couple of interviews, but I was just so brutally honest in them. I was not towing the line in terms of, yeah, you know, the billables, you know, I have no problem making those targets. I was just like, what are your billable hourly targets? And they would say X, Y, Z. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it started to become much more blunt as basically saying, I have no problem with working hard when I need to, but just for the sake of meeting targets, if the, you know, if the work doesn't actually demand it, no, I don't think that that's the best way to become a good lawyer. And thankfully, the interviews I had didn't appreciate that because that wasn't towing the line. I didn't get any offers until six months later with the right firm. And I was fortunate because my husband was working at the time, so I didn't have to worry about finding something quickly to pay the bills. I had the luxury of time. And so I was able to, you know, meet people casually, but without pressure anymore, because I realized that it wasn't meshing with my internal drum that way. And then found the right position with a guy that hired me on the spot. He was also a Bay Street ex expat. He had his own firm in Burlington. And he recognized the benefit of that experience. But he also said, look, 
you will have base fee level workout here because he'd been at it for like 40 years and was very well known in the commercial litigation bar. But he's like, you'll actually have a life. And to me, that was basically saying something borderline miraculous. Like I could have a life. My gut instinct that there must be more was starting to come to fruition. And so I spent three years with him getting not only more commercial litigation experience, but estate litigation experience. And then in my last year with him, he switched my practice areas over to solicitor work. So for those listeners who aren't familiar with that, that's taken me from out of the courtroom and into the transactional world because he thought that he could make more money off of me if I'm doing transactions even because he saw my aptitude in those as well. And then I left, you know, my post with him because I thought, I don't want to be a transactional lawyer. Famous last words, as Adrian knows, based on our conversations. <laughs> I just want to do litigation. So I went back into, you know, a mid-sized firm that then became you know, part of Galling WLG a few years later because I wanted to do litigation and they were hiring a litigation associate. So getting to the point of structuring what I have today started with, in retrospect, that summer of 2012, where I'm realizing that I don't want to work on Bay Street. I don't want to work in this kind of lifestyle. I don't want to have those demands on my time and come hell or high water, I'll find a different way. And then starting off with a position at a very small firm, in the suburbs, the kind of firm that's, you know, any anybody outside of Bay Street, you know, Bay Street lawyers will know that they tend to, you know, look down upon, you know, sole practitioners and folks out in the suburbs and in smaller cities. And now I was doing exactly that. I was working at one of those firms that was not held in high esteem by, you know, the, you know, prejudicial, the prejudice really, Bay Street lawyers who are very classist, right? But as I quickly discovered with that boss of mine, he was doing very high caliber work and he was putting a lot of those Bay Street partners who he had gone to school with and articled with to shame on files of his. So that opened my eyes in terms of the possibilities. And then at the next firm I went into, it was more of the same, more of the, I realized very quickly that I'd gone right back onto the same hamster wheel. And then when a door closed for me at that firm and I had the opportunity to decide differently now, at that point I was six years into call. And I just come back from mat leave. So I had one child. I now have three. But at that time, I had one child and coming back from mat leave and thinking, this is no longer for me. And you know how they say that parenthood changes you? It absolutely does. And you're thinking, this is not an environment in which I'm going to thrive. And it was my husband, actually, that encouraged me to start my own firm. Because at first, I was starting to go the predictable easier route of, well, let me look for postings for associates and let me chat with my network and see if anybody knows anything. Maybe I'll go in-house at the city. But he was saying, he's like, you're just going to swap one set of political BS for another. Set your own table. Set your own firm culture. You have six years in, you have clients that love you, you are good at what you do. You can hack it. And that encouragement from my spouse, layered on with all the little seeds that in retrospect were being sowed along the way in my professional life story, led to me just taking the plunge. So I left that firm on the Thursday. It was before a long weekend. And the following Tuesday, I had my own practice started up. Three clients that came with me from that firm, because clients can choose. You're not poaching them. Clients can choose who they want to go with. That's right. I have continued to build it into what we have today, where you know, I have work-life integration, not work-life balance. I think that's really unrealistic and it's too heavy and onus, but my work and my life are intertwined and in a beautiful way. And I have support staff that are wonderful. I have an associate lawyer who is wonderful and it's good. It's good. If you would have told me, told that, you know, young woman in the summer of 2012, 10 years ago, that I'd be where I am today. I probably would have laughed at you. And the fact that I'm not even doing, you know, international human rights law like I thought I would be in 2007 and 2008. But I am so much happier because I have control and because I have support. And so I'm able to control in terms of control over my life, my clients, the kinds of files I do, what I charge. And ultimately, as long as there's enough work, how much I take home at the end of the day. That's right. And the only BS I have to put up with is if it's coming from externally, you know, say other lawyers on a file. But if I don't like a client, I have the freedom to fire them. 
And so exercising that at the outset, that if I see red flags, having the freedom to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't have the capacity to take on your file at the moment, which is code for, I am not getting into that can of worms. Yep. <laughs> and that's just so freeing. Yeah. So that's my journey, you know, of getting to where I am, where you go from a point in your career of having really no control. Everything is in somebody's hands, but you're learning. So you don't really know what you don't know. And then slowly calling away like layers of an onion, getting to the core of who you are, what you want, what is important to you. And then having the guts to step out on face and just do it. It's not the easy route that everybody advertises that you should do, like, especially in law school, like you said, Adrian, that we should go to base, go on, go to Bay Street, you know, become an associate, become a junior partner, become a senior partner, maybe go in-house if you find a slot for you after a few years, but that's what you do. But entrepreneurship is not encouraged, but it's been so rewarding. It's not for everyone, but I think it's for more people than many may think. I agree with you. I agree with you. I just, you've, you've mentioned OCI and I, I just remember I went through the OCI process too. I applied to three firms and others would apply to like 40, 50 firms. Mm -hmm. And just the burnout from that process alone mm -hmm. was unbelievable. And I learned a lot actually through that process, watching other people thinking this is not, this isn't like, it doesn't have to be this way. No. It does not have to be this way. And I also loved your point about being able to identify and harness your own internal drum. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what that says to me is that you, through a lot of growth and reflection and evaluation, you identify what you, you really I, do a bunch of things. You identify what it is that you want internally and not based on external pressure or validation based on internal values, core values and validation from coming from yourself and from being in a position where you feel that you have the agency to set your own boundaries because those things have to be coupled together. You can identify what you want, all you want, but if you're not willing to set the boundaries and really take, I, I always say, you know, you have to be in control of your time and of your energy because if you're not, somebody else is. And part of this process is being able to identify what needs to happen, what boundaries you need to set in order to say, no, that's not something that is in alignment with the kind of life that I want. And for you, it was saying no to billable hours, which, and I agree 100% with your perspective on that. And, you know, I, I immediately, when you told that story, I thought of an experience that I had interviewing at a Bay Street firm. And I was so excited for this interview. It was, they had the files, they had, oh, they, it was like, it was like where I was, like, I thought I was going to be there. You know, I knew somebody who was there and, you know, it was just like, everything seemed to align. And then I got to the interview. I showed up, you know, you're dressed for an interview. Like you are dressed, you're in the heels, you're in the whole thing. I show up and everyone in the, in the lobby of the firm. So this firm was in a, in a tall tower and there were several floors and the first floor was the lobby. And the support staff were absolutely at each other's throats, screaming at each other at seven o'clock in the morning. Cause I had to go before I went to my other, my, my other job at a different law firm. So you have to go before you have to like create all these, you know, crazy times that you're interviewing because, you know, you don't want to make it seem like you're interviewing somewhere else. Yep. And so I get there and that was like red flag number one. And I thought, if people are screaming like this, like, like, it was like I was a ghost. I wasn't even there. Like no one cared that I was sitting right there in the waiting room. It was like, it was like nothing I've ever seen before. And I haven't seen it since, quite frankly. Oxtick 101. Oh, oh my, my God. Goodness. And I was sitting there while they were just ripping each other apart. Like it was, it was absolutely crazy. And of course, then I get called and I'm like, where am I now? Like it's a beautiful building, beautiful offices, but like what is going on inside? <laughs> Oh, what is happening? And I'm called into the interview and I sit down and I'm all, you know, done up and my blazer and everything. And the partners show up and they're in like the most casual clothes. And I thought you don't even have the decency to like get dressed for this interview. Yeah. That was you didn't think 
highly enough of you as a potential candidate to put themselves remotely together. Right, right. And so that was that was red flag two. <laughs> that was number two. Number three was in the interview, they said, and at the time I was, I had my PhD and I was, I was a professor at the same time because I'd been a professor all throughout law school and prior. And so I was sitting in the interview and they said to me, so when are you going to stop this teaching thing? And I said to them, and I like, and this is what I'm saying is I had my internal drum and I had my boundaries and I had everything because I had taken so much time to figure things out before that. Grad school for me was really essential in, in figuring out who I was, what my boundaries were and who I wanted to be, the kind of life and the whole thing. So they said that to me, you know, when are you going to stop this whole teaching thing? And I said, oh, I don't think you understand who I am then. And they sort of sat back and they were like, what are you talking about? I said, do you, you don't understand how much value this brings? The fact that like I have an appointment at a university, that I'm also a researcher, that I do X, Y, and Z. And like, we had this really frank, and I was surprised at myself even for having this conversation. I left and I was like, I... You know, I didn't care whether or not I got that job, but I left saying, I told my, I don't think we definitely, no, we weren't married at the time. So I told my, I think, anyway, my partner, whom I'm married to, I called him and I said, I like, I don't know what just happened. <laughs> you just <laughs> but, broke all the rules yeah. <laughs> of interviewing, but you felt good for it because you yeah. realized that it wasn't aligning at all, like you said, with your internal exactly. drum. And this would have been a very bad decision for you if they had made you an offer and you'd accepted it. And they did. So they made me an offer. And I turned it down and I was shocked after that, after that conversation that they made me an offer and I turned it down. And then I spoke to the person who I, the other person who I knew at the firm. And I just said, listen, like, here's what happened in the interview. And this is why I didn't take it. And they were like, oh, that's too bad. Blah, blah, blah. But they, you know, it, it, it was no sweat off their back. You know, I, I had all these feelings about it. Like, oh my God, I'm going to be letting somebody down all this external stuff. Right. And I very, very quickly realized you have to like these boundaries are really important, really important. And and so then jumping way forward, you also made the point that motherhood changes you, parenthood changes you, whatever that looks like for you. And for me, it absolutely did. And I became a mother in June 2020, mm-hmm. first lockdown. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> when I was, you know, I had been interviewing for like months and I was gathering, you know, all this, you know, all, you know, all these connections and networking and, and I had all these offers that suddenly went poof. And I thought, okay, well, I now have a newborn. And my plan was, you're going to laugh at this. My plan was have the newborn. Okay. Three months later, I was going to go back to the downtown firms that I was, that I was, you know, that I was maybe going to accept these offers from. Three months, okay. That's what I gave myself. I put her. I put my my daughter's name on like wait list for you know, like infant care and daycare and all these things and looking for nannies and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, three months. That's enough time. <laughs> that's enough. And then I had her. And for me, we won't get into a lot of this, but you know, because the last two years has been really challenging for everybody in different ways, including myself. But in addition to that, it gave me the time to actually become the mother that I wanted to be, that I didn't know I wanted to be. Yeah, absolutely. And make choices that I didn't know that I needed to make. And I ended up being home with her, starting my firm and working remotely. I was home with her for 16 months while I was working. I mean, my schedule was like off the wall. Like it was, it, I couldn't, that was un- completely unsustainable. Plus I was teaching and I was building Apply Yourself, like everything was happening. But I learned the choices that I wanted to make without the pressure of anybody else, really. Because everybody yep. else was in lockdown. Like no one could come over and pressure me. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful time in some ways, right? In and some ways. Banning stuff of those cracks of beauty there and leverage them. 100%. It's so funny because similarly, I remember when I went on mat leave with my first, I remember saying, because I was at the last room I was at, the one that became you know, an extension of the Hamilton office of Gallings. I remember saying, oh yeah, I'll just be back after four or five months. And I remember the female partners looked at me who both had kids and they were like, this is not the 1980s where for one of them, she could only take a month. She, They both said, take the time. You will not regret it. In fact, you may find it hard to come back to work and that's okay. Most women find that. And they were absolutely right. 
absolutely right. Once you were home with them, you know, yes, it's hard, especially when you're having to juggle, like I had to do with my second and third, juggle a practice with a newborn. But yeah, it absolutely demolishes in many ways your prior, your pre-existing expectations and priorities and really puts them through kind of like putting them through the flame for like, you know, to be distilled and reduced to the bare essence of what is needed. And then using that, you know, as a springboard for your next steps, because now you really realize what matters to you at your core. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And so can you talk to me about the importance of visualizing your future? Because this is something that I introduce to all of my clients. And often the reaction that we very, that we at the beginning get is like, oh, that's, you know, it's too hard. I don't know what I would think. And all of that. And then three months later, after we've been working together for a a period of time, they say, oh, but that doesn't align with my vision. So, and so it's amazing what it does and the way that visualizing your future catapults you forward in a way that no other skill can actually do. So could you talk to me a bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So The nice thing about visualization is that it gives you something to strive for. And really for, I'm sure most of your listeners are type A or at least type A hybrid personalities where we've all been overachievers, you know, getting the good marks, getting the good experience, because we know that you want to go on to very demanding careers that often require professional training. So it's setting goals isn't foreign to most of us, but setting goals for you know, more than the next year or two is what's foreign to us. Other than like lofty, maybe, maybe I want to go to law school. Maybe I want to go to med school. Maybe I want to do, you know, get my MBA. But beyond that, we haven't really thought more broadly. Visualizing for me has been so important because it helps to give me a check-in as to whether steps I'm taking are getting me closer to that goal. Going back to that conversation I had with that articling friend of mine, right? About at the end of the day, you know, when I'm gone from this earth, and we all will be, because there are two things that are certain in life, right? Death and taxes. So, and I get to about the taxes part, <laughs> the state lawyer there. But death for sure is eventual. We hope that the Grim, Grim Reaper proverbially doesn't come for us till we're old and gray and a good 95 plus years of age. But there's never any guarantee of that. So knowing that at the highest level, what will matter to us on our last days on earth if we have the opportunity to reflect and contemplate, like say a person's passing away from a terminal illness, what will matter at the end of the day? And then working back from that in terms of creating your vision. And then also on a shorter scale, especially if you are a business owner or are developing your own practice as an employee, but still effectively effectively required to think like a business person, even though you're an employee, thinking, where do I want to be in five to 10 years? Seriously. Like, where do I want to be? And how is that? How are those goals going to to take me closer to my ultimate goals in terms of what will matter to me most at the end of my life? For many of us, when we think about it, relationships are what matter the most at the end of our life. And so how can I, working back from that, maximize? Because you only have 24 hours in a day, including Beyonce. We all only have 24 hours in a day. How can I maximize my days to prioritize relationships, particularly with those that mean the most to me, but still carve out a rewarding career. And so then then you can start to put the pieces into place from there. Because for me, for instance, it came to meeting many more sole practitioners and small firm owners after I started my firm, most of them online through Facebook groups with other lawyers who include lawyers in the States, for instance. One group in particular that was insightful to me as we were building our firm, my husband and I, was lawyering lawyers on the beach. The name caught me and I'm like, what? But then it turns out it's about remote lawyering and flat fees to really free up your ability, speaking of the billable hour, using flat fees more and more to really leverage your time. And Through that group, one of the key admins there is a family law lawyer in Atlanta and a Black woman to boot, which is also a bonus. So she caught my attention for that as a fellow Black woman. And she has a small team around, I think, a a junior lawyer, I think a paralegal and a couple of clerks total with her about five persons. But even during COVID, 
seeing her earnings. Like she, she was quite frank about that and said that because of flat fees, and she's been practicing for 20 years, leveraging flat fees and practicing in a an area of law that allows her quite a bit of predictability in terms of how much each stage will cost. Because there's a science towards the, to using flat fees successfully. That on average, she was generating between 650 and 750 K US a year in revenue. And her team isn't, you know, working, you know, completely around the clock. On average, they're working eight hour days. So it's not like people are burning out. And that she was really only working in and on her firm three to four days a week. And she did, she wasn't married. She didn't have kids. But her point was that she wanted to free up time to do what she wanted. She wanted to be able to hike and travel and, you know, just meditate and develop her own personal yoga practice and get certifications in that because that was her passion. So when it comes to visualizing, seeing examples by meeting people, even in the online sphere of people who are achieving what you were told, what we were told, Adrian, when we were articling and at law school, is really impossible. Like if you wanted to think about A, being a sole practitioner, B, being a successful high earning, your, you know, sole practitioner on your own. That, that's your own firm. Like when you convert those US dollars to Canadian, she's basically pushing almost a million in earnings in Canadian dollars a year. And she's doing that on her own, on her own terms with her own firm and has a life as well. She has time to enjoy her passions, time to, you know, pursue her interests. Her practice does not run her. She runs her practice. And there's a lot of other things that, you know, go into her ability to do what she does, including a lot of automation and building her own practice management software and everything. But it can be done is the point. So we're going into that overall vision of, okay, if relationships are priority to me, great. Obviously, earnings also have to be important because you have to make ends meet and you want to be comfortable. If you're not having to worry about making ends meet and being able to save and be able to enjoy some things in life, you don't need to live an excessive lifestyle by any means, but to have comforts, then you want to have earnings. And plus, you want to be able to, you know, have that professional level of satisfaction and some success. Like profit is not a bad word. You want to shoot for profitability and shoot for good earnings, but not at the expense of your relationships long term. So then seeing people who've done it and are thinking, okay, so in terms of my own vision, what steps do I need to take in my firm? Because she's not an anomaly. There are many lawyers like her and they overwhelmingly tend to be solos and small firm owners. How, what changes that I I need to make in my firm, in my practice to maximize my odds of achieving something like that or even more than that? And then refining my vision as I go along. So meeting people, not approaching things as a, in a silo and looking at their examples when you see that they're doing something you want to do and then chatting with them or otherwise finding out more, say in her case, she wrote a book about it. So it's super easy to look that up. Okay. What can I implement? So in five years, where do I want to be in 10 years, where do I want to be? And does it still allow for me to see my kids growing up, to see my spouse, to, you know, have some time to do something that I enjoy And then refine that because you're not going to have it all set one day. It's going to be a work in progress and being gentle with yourself as you have your vision. Because thinking of my vision as being written more in sand than in in stone. And so sand is in, it can be erased. I can start over. I can pivot. I can scratch it out, but moving forward with that. Because then otherwise you, you can be easily on autopilot and plateau and not really realize that you're so underutilizing your own potential and you really are settling in a bad way because you're not doing, you're, you're not living your professional and personal life in a way that's as fulfilling as it could be. But you also have to be unafraid to take some risks because what she's doing, that Laura in Atlanta, she's obviously practicing a lot very differently than most of her colleagues. Most people who are doing things differently and successfully, both monetarily and personally, are doing things differently. So as part of your vision, you have to be willing to check that as well and be willing to step outside of the main lanes of the highway of your profession and think there must be a better way of doing that. And our generation has been really good compared to prior generations of rethinking ways of doing our professional fields, all, you know, more so on our own terms than 
the Gen Xers, you know, than the baby boomers. So you have support among your peers in society more so than prior generations did. So does that answer the question? Of absolutely. How kind of worked through that. It's yeah, absolutely. Multi-space. And I think that one of the really important things that I'll just draw out as sort of the final point here is that it's okay. In fact, I think it's necessary to be vulnerable in that process with yourself and to allow yourself to actually feel things. That's number one. And then number two is that I think it's equally as important to, especially in cases where the future, whatever that means, whether it's five years or 10 years, isn't that clear to you, then I think it's really important to pull out how you want to feel in five years, how you want to feel in 10 years and let that guide you. Are the choices that you're making today, what is your next best step that you can take today to get you one step closer to feeling whatever it is you want to feel in five years, 10 years, whether it's I want to feel healthy, I want to feel fit, I want to feel secure, I want to feel happy, I want to feel fulfilled, I want to feel supported, I want to feel whatever it is that you want to feel, I think is equally as important as the rest of it, especially if you know, many of our listeners are students and the five years from now might not be all that clear. And so the question becomes, or at least begins, how do you want to feel in five years? Do you want to feel accomplished? Do you want to feel proud? Do you want to feel confident? Do you want to feel secure? Do you want to be on a path? Do you want to feel like your path is in alignment with you? And so I think I want to just, I think that that's a really solid note to end this wonderful conversation on and ask you your final question, which is, do you have a piece of advice? Maybe it's, you know, one or two or plus pieces of advice that you would give your younger self? Mm, My younger self. And specifically, I probably focus on around the age at which I was going to law school. So about 21. And what would I say to 21-year-old me? A few things. Number one, don't be afraid to pivot in many ways in your life because things are not always going to go the way that you expect, but there are always doors B and C and maybe even endless doors of opportunity otherwise. So don't be so fixated on door A not working out in the way that you want or completely closing that you miss the other opportunities that are glaring in your face. You require, they require a pivot, but don't be afraid to make that pivot. Number two would be, you know, don't be afraid to take risks. I think especially as women, men are generally more socialized in our society to take risks. Women, not as much. Because so often we're told that if we just keep our head down and do good work, we'll be rewarded. We don't really need to take risks like starting our own business, doing things differently than most persons in our fields do in terms of our career trajectory. But really, you know, don't be afraid to go against the grain of it. If the mainstream trajectory aligns with that inner drum of yours that's beating inside of you, then great. But if it doesn't, don't punish yourself by staying longer in the mainstream path than is absolutely necessary to get to your next step. I love a good colleague of mine, law school friend of mine who posts a lot lot on LinkedIn. He uses the hashtag arming the rebels because he's also a fellow solo small firm owner who used to be on Bay Street. There are many of us. I like even just the thought behind that hashtag arming the rebels. Don't be afraid to be a rebel in a good sense. Doing things differently in a way that really aligns with your values and will bring you the most satisfaction, which means that for those of us people pleasers out there, many of us women are made, you know, socialized to be people pleasers. You're not going to please everybody. So don't be afraid to make decisions and stand firm in them, even if they're not popular, but because they are the right choice, they sit well with that gut instinct that we have. So I'd say with those two in mind, everything else falls into place. Don't be afraid to pivot. And don't be afraid to do things differently as long as it's in alignment with your goals and your values. I love it. Thank you so much, Shana. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. It's such a joy chatting with you as always. Thank you. And thank you for listening. And we'll see you next time.
Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want, and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at applyyourselfglobal and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.